Hey y'all, I bring you a new series, one we have talked about doing for a while, the Canadian version of the Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg. Now I know some of you are going to say, but wait, you said you would make one for the New England area first, or that you would hold a vote to see which one we would cover first, Canada or the UK. But I have an explanation. Quite simply, a Redditor with the very accurate name of Kindly Patrick offered to make me a Canadian version, and how could I say no? I mean, that's the most time-consuming part, scouring the internet for hours on hours, trying to find some cases that haven't been covered a million times before. So with that, I want to give thanks to Kindly Patrick for putting it together, but I will offer this disclaimer. I am still going to be putting certain cases on here that I want to cover, because some of the ones on this iceberg we have already previously discussed. With all the background information out of the way, Ah, Canada, home of ice hockey and Tim Hortons, and people who are very kind and polite. And hey, that's the reputation Canadians have, right? I mean, they're the only people on earth who can stub their toe on a chair and then apologize for bumping into it. But Canada, like every country, does have a dark side. You may say they have a seedy underbelly, especially when it comes to its treatments of indigenous peoples, which it has a bad reputation for. So much so, that even Americans, who also harbor a bad legacy for its treatment of indigenous peoples, look at Canada and be like, dude, come on, that's frigged up. So with that, grab your Canada Dry ginger ale and your covered bridge chips. We are going on a mysterious trip up north. You may have read that oh-so-interesting factoid that 90% of Canada's population lives within 125 miles of the U.S. border. And that might actually not surprise any of you, considering that a lot of Canada is not inhabitable. A big part of this is due to something called the Canadian Shield, a vast geological region that makes up nearly half of Canada. During the last ice age, glaciers swept across this part of the country, removing soil and leaving a pretty and hospitable landscape, making it incredibly difficult for agriculture which historically is what led to settlements. But it's not only the rough land that puts you at a disadvantage, it's also that bone-chilling weather. That, of course, only gets worse when you move further north into the Arctic regions of Canada. But having said that, humans have found a way to live here in small numbers, particularly those peoples that we know as the Inuits, whose villages dot the vast barren landscapes. It's here our first mystery takes place. November, 1930 fur trapper Joe LaBelle was traveling through what was then called the Northwest Territory, now known as Nunavut Territory, and he was on his way to hunt some beaver and caribou. On his trip, he would come across an Inuit village off the coast of Lake Anjakuni. Now, as mentioned, these villages were not rare to come across. In fact, the trappers and hunters that braved the harsh elements knew where these little communities were located and would often stop on their way and rest where thankfully, the natives met them with open arms. In this village in particular, Joe had already visited before. Walking in exhausted, he made his way into the settlement, but on his way in, he immediately realized something was off, because Lake Anjakuni Village was usually pretty busy, which in part was due to the 25 people that lived here. Joe would finally make his way into the frozen outpost and began walking around. He thought it very unusual, and a tad eerie that no one was walking about or tending to business. But he did see smoke coming from some of the houses, and his hungry stomach could not wait any longer. So he decided to start checking on some of the houses and found no one inside. He thought next he would walk down to the fish market where someone was bound to be trading goods. Yet, not a soul was there. Although everything at the market looked normal and goods set around, he even seen rifles, sleds, and kayaks. He was dumbfounded, but just then, as he was standing there trying to figure out what was going on, he finally seen a fire in the distance. A small fire that seemed to have a cooking pot hoisted above. Joe thought, there they are, and began walking towards it. But on his way, he got a strange feeling. Something was not right, but he kept moving, and he made it to the fire, where he found a pot of meat cooking above it. Yet, no one was around. Joe continued his search, and nearby, he found some unfinished clothing which had needles in it. It was then he concluded that 
The villagers, for some reason, had to leave suddenly. Even by this point, though, Joe had not considered that something dire had happened, but that would change soon, because he got to wondering which way the villagers had went, because considering there was still fresh meat cooking above the fire, there had to be fresh footprints nearby. But after searching the whole village, he didn't find one human track. But what really freaked him out was when he found the dogs, which had not been barking for good reason. They were still tied up and covered in snow because they had died from starvation, which kind of went against everything else Joe seen that told him these villagers had all fled just recently. On top of this, Joe soon found some graves that had also been dug up, and whoever's remains had been buried there, presumably an ancestor of one of the villagers, had been removed. This was made even more odd by the fact that the ground was frozen, but this was finally enough to send Joe over the edge, and he rushed away from the village and quickly went towards the closest telegraph station he could find, where he then got a hold of the mounted police and reported what he had seen. About an hour later, they arrived and made their way to the village and did a walk around. They also did a search around the area and found nothing, although they did at one point reportedly see some strange lights above the horizon, which disappeared within a short amount of time. But these lights were not caused by a fire. Instead, they were bluish lights that seemed to pulsate. While at least one source stated that a trapper named Armand Laurent had been in the general area at the time and he was tracked down by the mounted police. And he told them that him and his son had seen a cylindrical object that transformed into a bullet shape and then headed towards the lake. I take it, this was supposed to be a UFO. Regardless, the mounted police looked over the scene and was just as puzzled as to what happened, but they were sure of one thing. This did not happen fairly recently. They estimated the Inuits had been gone for at least two months before Joe ever made it in, and that's basically it. The villagers were never found again, and it was never explained how these 25 or so people just up and vanished. Or why? Or has it been explained? Let's look at the origin of this story first. It was actually written about around the time of the incident on November 27, 1930, by journalist Emmett Kelleher in an article for a newspaper in Danville, Virginia of all places. Now for whatever reason, he kind of just fell through the cracks. He was never really picked up by many publications, but over 30 years later, he was published in a book called stranger than science. So right off the bat, it's kind of weird it didn't make bigger news, and that's led to the top theory that the whole thing was a fictional event. According to skeptics, there's way too many inconsistencies. First of all, the number of people at the village has changed in various tellings. For example, I gave the original number of 25, but variations since have cited a much higher number, even around 2,000 people, which doesn't make much sense at all. Likewise, the original story said only one grave had been dug up. Finally, the UFO part of the mystery was added decades later. And finally, there's just no evidence around the lake that any village was there. Furthermore, journalist Emmett Kelleher, who had written the story, had been accused even before this of writing exaggerated articles. And heck, even in this story of the missing village, he used a photo of a different village and claimed he was the one that supposedly vanished. So there's that. Likewise, the RCMP has officially stated the story was fabricated and marked the case closed. They even cited a large settlement in that area was highly unlikely. However, there are a few things that go against this for the skeptics. First of all, for years, the skeptical argument was, this story didn't pop up in the 30s. Instead, it was recorded in that book, Stranger Than Science, in 1967, which falsely claimed that the story really happened in 1930, citing an alleged newspaper article. But the skeptics believed that was nothing more than a fictional short story written for that book and that no such article was ever written. And they were convinced they were right, but they were proven wrong in this one because the story was eventually traced down and proven to be from a very real newspaper in 1930, written by Emmett Kelleher to which the skeptics then changed their argument and said, you know what, Emmett Kelleher made it up instead. But there's other things that could hint at it being real, like Joe LaBelle was a very real trapper 
that did travel to this very area, and he knew it very well. Now, skeptics have correctly pointed out that LaBelle is not in the records for having a trapping license at this point, but numerous trappers were working illegally out in this part of the country at that time. So the fact that LaBelle didn't have a trapping license means nothing. Although, I have to note, other than this one article, we have no documents by LaBelle that states these events did happen. But another possible clue to it being real is, about 155 miles north of the alleged Lake Anjakuni village, another Inuit village would end up playing home to a 10-year-old boy who had apparently wandered in just months after Lake Anjakuni village vanished. The boy was not from any of the local tribes and had presumably came from far away, and he was taken in by these people. This story was never followed up on, so his origin is not clear, but it's possible he may have belonged to the Lake Anjakuni village and made his way there. Another strange instance was that of an Inuit named Salmek, who was brought to a hospital via the Hudson Bay Railway. He was suffering from frozen legs. Investigators thought he might know what had happened to the village, so they found a translator and planned to question him, but he refused to speak about where he had came from or what had happened to him. So we know the main theory is that the whole thing was a hoax, but let's take a look at the other angle. What if it did happen? Then what are those theories? That's when you get to the more supernatural theories like time loops or reality glitch. Others cite that the light seen in the sky, assuming they were really seen on that night, were of extraterrestrial origin and had something to do with the disappearance. While there is a conspiracy that the Canadian government had something to do with it, possibly forcing these people to move, or maybe it was the result of an experiment gone wrong, which might also suggest why the mounted police covered up the whole thing. A more down-to-earth theory suggests that the village was quickly abandoned due to an oncoming blizzard that was supposed to hit soon, which might explain why the dogs were buried under the snow. Another suggestion is that the food was running low, but this doesn't explain why they left meat cooking in the pot or why they didn't take any of their belongings. A more dark theory is that the Inuit had a run-in with some trappers who did not have good intentions, or maybe they got into a dispute with these trappers and were forced to leave the village at gunpoint and killed somewhere else. Of course, there was no evidence for this either. January 6th, 1922. Caledonia Mills Antigonish, Nova Scotia. Farmer Leo McGillivray would be a little startled to hear someone knocking at the front door of his home. Not only was his farm in a pretty isolated location, but there was a pretty rough blizzard going on at the time. So Leo expected whoever was there must have came for an urgent matter, and that it was. When he opened the door, he would see 14-year-old Mary Ellen the adopted daughter of his closest neighbors, Alexander and Janet McDonald. Mary Ellen was here to ask of help from Leo because the family had a very peculiar problem. Apparently, fires were breaking out in the home. That's right, not one fire, multiple. Luckily for the McDonald's, they had been catching them in time before they got out of control, but they kept spawning up at random locations and now her adoptive parents were having a hard time containing them. Well, this struck Leo odd as it would anyone, but he decided to go check it out, but not before asking a couple of other neighbors to go with him. When they arrived, they would see immediately what it was that Mary Ellen was describing. At certain spots in the home, the room would suddenly light up, almost like sparks you would see during a short circuit of a power line. Then, blue flames would appear, sometimes even on wet papers or clothing. There was even moments when the wallpaper would burst into flames. And as soon as they were extinguished, new flames would pop up somewhere else. Leo would also note that strangely, there seemed to be no heat coming from these fires. The concerned neighbors began searching the home for any flammable materials and found nothing. Soon, everything was quieted down though, and the neighbors went home. This night would become known in Canada as the night of 38 fires, but the McDonald's were accustomed to weird stuff happening at this home. Actually, stuff like this had been going on for 20 years. The family had weird things happen all the time, 
like household belongings vanishing, only to reappear at remote spots on the farm, while horses and other livestock would somehow be set loose from the stalls. Some mornings, Alexander would go out to find the cows and horses had been switch stables, while other times the animals' tails had been braided. Even stranger, some of the heavier farm equipment would be found moved to the opposite side of the property, and most notably, some of the neighbors reported seeing a weird blue light around the barn. The flames would continue over the following week, so the family soon asked the neighbors to keep an eye out, because they were convinced an arsonist was coming onto the property and setting the fires, possibly in an attempt to run the family off. And on January 12th, six days after Leo had made his first visit there, someone from his household, a Michael, whom I assume was Leo's son, made his way over with another neighbor, John Kinney, to check on the McDonald family. As they were making their way to the old farm, they spotted something odd. On the upper floor of the McDonald home, they seen a hand holding a piece of white cotton out of the window. They waved it three times before it was pulled back in. When arriving, they would ask the McDonald's what all that was about, and they stated nobody had even been upstairs that morning. So as you can see, a very weird place. And this doesn't even take into account that the fires had still not ceased. So the McDonald's now feared the worst, as they were afraid to even lay down to sleep because they worried that the home would catch fire and they would burn to death. So they abandoned the home and moved in with Leo temporarily. Soon, word spread about the bizarre happenings, and a journalist by the name of Harold Whitten heard about the story from the small community and went to investigate. But he would not go alone. He would ask retired police chief, Peter Carroll, to go with him. The men soon made their way to Caledonia Mills and made arrangements to spend a couple of nights at the farm. And while there, they did not see one fire, but they did report hearing footsteps throughout the night, as well as other eerie noises inside the home. But the weirdest event would be that both reported feeling like something slapped their faces and arms. Now I know this story is already weird enough and too paranormal for some, and this next part will only make that worse, because apparently Harold claimed that he began automatic writing, which we have discussed in previous videos. It's supposed to be where someone is taking over by a strange force and then their hands are used to write for some unknown entity. Well, that's what Harold began doing, and soon he got answers. The writing revealed that spirits had been the plague of this home for the past 20 years, and that the spirits had also been the ones that had slapped the two men's faces. Although Whitten would continue writing for two hours, he never revealed what else he noted down. He only stated he was important and deeply personal. Now for the retired police chief, Peter Carroll, who seemed to be more skeptical, he himself did state he believed whatever was going on at the farm had not been caused by the McDonald family and probably not by people at all. By now, the story was becoming big news across Canada, and it brought in a scientist and parapsychologist, Walter Franklin Pierce, who was invited to spend a week at the McDonald farm. He would leave after completing his stay at the home, and he came out and stated he had the answer. He claimed that the fires were not unexplained and in fact had been set by Mary Ellen. Now if you think this was going to be some easy skeptical theory, then you're in for a surprise because Pierce theorized that Mary Ellen had set them in a, quote, altered state of consciousness. He also claimed she was behind in her years mentally, and she had suffered from dream states, from which was difficult to snap out of. He believed that she was setting the fires while in this dreamlike state and was not even realizing it. She could have even been sleepwalking. As far as physical evidence goes, he noted he did come across inflammable liquid which had been used to set the fires, but his most critical piece of evidence was where the burns had been, or maybe I should say, where they had not been. They were never higher than the reach of a person five foot tall, which was the height of Mary Ellen. So the case is closed, right? Well, there were two issues with his theory. First of all, the McDonald's had been having weird stuff happen on the farm since 1900, and Mary was not adopted until 1910. Furthermore, many of the fires had been started when Mary Ellen wasn't even in the home, to which Pierce did not have an answer for. Of course, 
The family didn't believe him, nor did the neighbors who had witnessed the fires and the other strange events. They noted that Mary Ellen was a good kid and would not do such things. However, she continued to be blamed by the press, and it temporarily caused her so much psychological anguish that she ended up being committed to a mental facility. However, she did rebound and go on to live a normal life. The McDonald's, on the other hand, never returned to the farm, and years later, it burned down suspiciously, and arson investigators could never find a cause. To this day, the main theories are someone inside the home was doing it, most likely Mary Ellen, or someone outside the home was tormenting the family, possibly in an attempt to get them to move, or maybe, just maybe, it was the result of real unexplained phenomena. In 1995, a man who has chosen to remain anonymous was on vacation and sightseeing in Seven Chutes Park in La Nodiere, Quebec. It was here that he would spend the day exploring the pine forest and waterfall, as well as walking around a rocky peak that looks down over the area. And it's there we come across our first cryptid mystery. As our unnamed man was walking along, he stopped to take some photos as one might at this location. And after an uneventful hike, he went back to his vehicle and drove home. It was after returning that he began going over his photos that he noticed something odd. In one of them, there appeared to be a tall brown figure standing near some trees. This figure sort of looked like the fabled Bigfoot, although it seemed to have a baboon-like snout. The creature appeared to be staring right at our sightseer which he thought was odd because he never seen anything while he was out there taking the photos. Even stranger, he noticed whatever this was appeared to be holding something. Many have suggested a white dog. The photographer was so stunned by what he seen that he allegedly went back to take more photos in the same spot, but this time he took along a friend, whom went and stood in the same exact spot that this alleged cryptid did. And then the man took more photos and compared the two. From that, he gathered that whatever this creature was, it had to be at least eight foot tall. He based that on his friend, who was six foot tall and was barely noticeable due to the dense vegetation. Although, I don't think the photos of his friend ever made it online. Regardless, it's went down as one of the most credible and intriguing cryptid photos ever taken in Canada. And to this day, no one is sure exactly what was seen, although there are a few theories. For one, even the biggest Bigfoot proponents note that this thing doesn't fit the typical Sasquatch description, particularly the nose, and they suggest whatever it was did not belong to the Bigfoot family, which has led many to suggest something closer to that of a dogman. And interestingly, the indigenous tribes in Canada have actually long told stories about a cryptid said to inhabit the remote wilderness, and it's known as the Gugway. They are said to be seven to eight foot tall ape-like creatures with shaggy fur and an elongated head like a gorilla. By the early 1900s, reports by Europeans started popping up as well, in which they described it as a mix between a canine and an ape. So is this photo of a Gugway? That can probably be ruled out for two reasons. For one, the Gugway can be traced to the indigenous peoples living on the west coast of Canada, not here where our story takes place. Secondly, according to the lore, the Gugway are supposed to be extremely aggressive, and the creature in this photo apparently wasn't. The next weird question is, what exactly is he carrying? As mentioned, many people believe it's a dog being packed. If that's the case, then you would assume this is the creature's next meal. But many are skeptical and point to the obvious answers. The creature in the photo is nothing more than a bear, or perhaps even an escaped gorilla, or maybe nothing more than a pile of rocks, or a big tree stump, and pareidolia is making us see something that's not there. Others take it a step further and note how the man has never came forward and insisted to remain anonymous, which could heavily imply that it was nothing more than a hoax, stating that the person in the photo is carrying some kind of pink stuffed animal to add to the mystery. But I will leave it to you all. Is this really a cryptid or something else? So 
September 4, 2010, 25-year-old Rachel Bagnell and 34-year-old Jonathan Jati were getting ready to depart on their three-day hike to Valentine Lake near Pemberton, British Columbia. The two had actually met at a climbing gym in Vancouver a few months prior, and since both were big on the outdoors and had a passion for adventure, they hit it off. And it was this Labor Day weekend that the two had planned to spend a romantic getaway before Rachel left to go finish her final year of medical school, and the two would be in a temporary long-distance relationship, so they wanted this last visit to be at a place they loved. It was a little bit before 7 a.m. when they left Vancouver, and they stopped at a Tim Hortons in Squamish for a coffee and hot chocolate at 7.42 a.m., and then drove through Whistler, Pemberton, and towards Birkin. John would park the car on the service road, and from there, it would be a five-hour hike to the heart-shaped Valentine Lake. The two then presumably got out and began their hike. That Tuesday, after the three-day weekend, Rachel's sister was supposed to meet up with her, but when she didn't show up, she was immediately alarmed, but thought that maybe the two lovebirds had decided to spend an extra day together, and she decided to wait. However, by the following day, when Rachel still had not returned, she would call the RCMP to report that Rachel and Jonathan had still not returned. It would take a full two days after this for the Mounties to finally locate Jonathan's car left on this out-of-the-way forest service road. It's there they peeked in to see two Tim Hortons coffee cups sitting in the cup holders. Also lying inside was Jonathan's cell phone. They would open the door and do a more thorough search and soon realized that the camping equipment was missing too. So it was obvious the couple had came here to camp and presumably something had happened and they may need rescuing. But there was an issue. As the search and rescue began looking over the area, they soon realized there was not one sign of any recent activity. And in a desolate location like this, you would think at least a footprint would be found or any kind of evidence the two people had just tracked through this area. But nope, even when they widened the search from the car, there was not one sign that anyone had came through this area in a long time. Of course, by this point, it had been five days since the two had made it there, so maybe any evidence had been erased by the elements, but the searcher sure felt that the whole thing was odd. But eventually, they did come across what they thought would be a huge break in the search, a pair of women's sunglasses, which were found pretty close to the lake. However, when police put out a notification for this, a female hiker came forward and stated she had lost those glasses earlier that year, and police were back at Squire One. The search continued, and the Mounties actually put out a call for volunteers, and soon the area was swarming with rescue teams from around the region. But unfortunately, the search was hampered by rain, but helicopters would eventually go over. But after 10 days of searching, with more than 2,000 man-hours, not one clue was found. RCMP Staff Sergeant Steve LeClaire, who was put in charge of the investigation, would even tell David Pilates that they never even found any of the cookware or any of the old campsites the two might have used. They also brought in bloodhounds to the vehicle, and the dogs never picked up a scent, not even at the car. And maybe it was washed away with the elements, but the fact that the investigators mentioned it seems to suggest they found it odd as well. But it would get even stranger, because Steve LeClaire would also do an interview with a magazine about the disappearance, and it's here that he noted it's not unusual for people to get lost in the backcountry, especially in Whistler, the town nearby where this took place. But in every search he had led, the people were always found, except for this time, with Jonathan and Rachel. And it was even more strange that not one thing was found. There was also the account from a man named David Steers, who was the leader of the search team from Pemberton. He stated that if Jonathan and Rachel had gotten lost in the mountains or on the trail to Valentine Lake, they would have easily found their way back to civilization. Because of its location, there's just not really a way to get so completely lost that you can't find your way back. Because of this, he believed something had happened to the two. He just wasn't sure what. With the search seemingly going nowhere, both families would get together and hire professional mountain guides, one of these being a three-time Mount Everest veteran, John Furneaux, along with Alpine guide, Patrick Delaney, 
and a very experienced local hiking guide, Eric Vizzo. These three would begin searching crevices and other locations in the mountains that the normal searchers couldn't access, like some of the mountain slopes where Jonathan and Rachel could have fallen or even become trapped. But these professionals were stumped too, because their search, which encompassed 110 square miles, found no new clues. That would be it for a while. A few months would go by until the next tip came in. When a hiker claimed he had just heard the story about Rachel and Jonathan's disappearance, and after reading about the case, he realized he had been in the general area around that time and seen smoke rising from a heavily wooded cliff overlooking a creek and on the southern slopes of one of the peaks. Searchers would follow the tip up and go to the exact location given by this man, and again, found nothing. About a month after this, another man in the area, about five miles southwest of Valentine Lake, was out chopping wood when he seen crows, or some kind of scavenging birds, circling the same peak that the other hiker had called in about. Search and rescue waited for the snow to melt and went to the area, and again, the RCMP found nothing. In the years since, nothing has been found. Although in 2018, shreds of men's clothing was found near a creek in the area, but were later determined to have not been Jonathan's. And that's pretty much it. There's not even a lot of theories. I mean, the obvious one is they had some kind of accident. But considering nothing, not one clue has ever surfaced, it makes it difficult to believe. I mean, this wasn't a search that took place years later. This was just five days later. There should have been something. And while it's possible the remains could have been taken by scavenging animals, the fact that the tent or cookware or any clothing has never been found is also odd. Not to mention the fact that the searchers noted how it would be almost impossible to get lost and not find your way out, which pretty much rules out that they got disoriented and then died from the elements. There is the one big danger though of the crevices and slopes, but considering the family hired three professionals to search the area, and one of them being the very best that money can buy in John Furneaux, and these three found nothing that indicated the two had an accident in one of these areas. And it's worth noting, the two could totally avoid the dangerous areas anyways, as a large part of this location is open meadow that one could hike in flip-flops. Others suggest a possible bear attack, or maybe even a rock slide. According to David Pilates, the parents have stated they believe foul play may have been involved, and question if Jonathan and Rachel ever even parked the car at the service trail. This is also believed by a lot of online sleuths who point to Jonathan leaving his cell phone behind as a clue that they did not voluntarily leave the car there. And detectives have checked their phone records, bank accounts, hacked their Facebook accounts, and went through their homes and just haven't found anything that could indicate this. And over a decade later, and we are no closer to finding out what happened to them. February 25th, 1909, Hamilton, Ontario. A man named Thomas Kinraid, a local school principal and widely beloved in the community, would head home around noon to spend lunch with his family. Thomas and his wife Isabel were a pretty well-to-do family, which did not come from him being a principal only. In fact, Thomas owned 30 rental properties in town and made a pretty good living off of it. And although their two sons had done moved out and started their own families, Thomas and Isabel still shared the family home with their three daughters, 25-year-old Ethel, 23-year-old Florence, and 16-year-old Gertrude. The family would enjoy their meal and get back to their day, with Thomas returning to school with his daughter Gertrude, while Isabel would remain home with Ethel and Florence. And it's here that the three would begin discussing a problem the family had been having that was now beginning to make them a little bit worried. It seemed that some homeless people had been lingering around the general area and would repeatedly come up to the Kenraid yard and knock on the door and ask for handouts. And they were also said to harass the family. Allegedly, these men came from the train yard, which was located nearby where it was implied that they tended to ride the rails. But what was particularly worrisome to the family was just the evening before, someone, presumably one of these individuals, 
tried to break into the home. After discussing the matter with them, and with Thomas I assume, Isabel decided she needed to go to the police department to file a report and ask them to look into the matter, and hopefully disperse the vagrants that now seem to be living in front of their home, and maybe planning to break in again. So Isabel would head to the police department shortly after 3 p.m., and that's when the nightmare would begin, because it would be sometime after this that the neighbor, a Mrs. Hickey, was startled when she began to hear crying coming across the street that seemed to be getting closer to her home. When she opened the door, Florence came running up screaming. Ethel was shot, shot six times. Florence was clearly terrified, so Mrs. Hickey called the police and then called the girl's father, Thomas. Now at this time, as you may remember, the mother, Isabel, had went to the police department to report the break-in from the previous evening, but she had just left as the phone call came into the station. She did, however, happen to stop at a newspaper office on her way home, where she would be stunned to see the news on the office's bulletin board that there had been a murder at her home. So just like Thomas, she rushed back, and this is when things get strange. The police had already made it to the home and were looking over the scene when Thomas arrived, and he would remark, quote, I expected that something like this would happen, which he did not elaborate on, but maybe he meant because of the break-in, right? However, when police asked him to ID the victim, Thomas was in shock, and I don't mean the typical parent shock one would have over a murdered child. Apparently, when Mrs. Hickey had called Thomas, there was some confusion, and he thought Florence was the victim, not Ethel. So, of course, this brought detectives back to the question, what exactly was you implying when you stated you expected something like this to happen? Thomas dodged the question and would later tell detectives he never said such a thing. But from this point, the case would be mired in controversy because maybe the family who seemed to have it all together and had the perfect little life was not so perfect after all, which we will return to. But for now, the detectives began asking Florence about what had happened, but she was so hysterical she could not tell much, although she did give a good description. The man was about 40, medium height and medium weight, and had a thick brown mustache. Most curiously, he was dressed better than the typical vagrants who had been seen in the neighborhood. Police would eventually calm her down enough, and Florence would begin telling the awful tale of how her sister was murdered. She recalled that the two were preparing to go on a walk, and were putting on their street clothes when Florence noticed she had a hoe in one of her gloves, so she went downstairs to get a needle and thread to mend it. But while she was downstairs, the doorbell rang, so she walked over and opened it to see one of the vagrants, and he asked for food. Florence told him to wait, and she would get him something to eat, but he shoved her out of the way and burst inside and demanded she go get money. This, of course, frightened Florence, and she quickly agreed to his demands and ran upstairs to get $10, or about $350 in today's money. When she got upstairs, she whispered to Ethel to lock herself inside, but she was not sure if she heard her or not, but Florence went to her room anyways, and panic set in. She did not know what to do, and while trying to think quickly, she heard a loud, unsettling noise from within the home. Whether this was the wood creaking or the house settling, it's not elaborated on, but this sound snapped Florence out of her hesitation. She quickly grabbed the cash and ran downstairs to hand to the intruder. Now some people might consider this odd, because the smart thing to do here might have been to stick your head out of a window and call for help, or maybe lock yourself inside with your sister, but maybe it's because she was too panicked. Regardless, it only got stranger from here. After handing money to the vagrant, she ran into the parlor room, kind of like the equivalent of a living room today. And it was here she tried escaping out of a window, but the man rushed into the room and grabbed her. But Florence would get away, and how she did, she never explained. But she ran into the kitchen and then out the back door into the backyard, where she panicked again. Because although the neighbor's home was right there out the back door, she did not ask them for help, nor did she try to jump the three-foot-high fence and escape. Instead, she just walked back into the home, where she seen the man just standing in the hallway while Ethel was laying in the dining room floor. Florence, by this point, was beyond panicked 
and was terrified. She sprinted by the man and out the front door, where she began screaming for Mrs. Hickey to call the police. And now it was the detectives hearing this story and looking over the scene, and they were downright confused. Why would a burglar just hang around, especially after being given the money? Or, if he did hang around, why didn't he take anything else with him from the home? Hamilton investigators began to wonder if they were looking for a madman, possibly an escaped convict or dangerous escape patient from a mental asylum. When neither of these checked out, though, they started to believe this all came from a personal motive, and they looked into the family closer, and they soon realized that although Florence was engaged to a man named Clara Wright, a theological student and son of a clergyman, she also enjoyed the attention of a man in Richmond, Virginia, named James Baum. Because see, Florence was actually an actress slash vaudeville showgirl, and she had lived in Richmond for quite a while, performing on stage. And according to her, she drew the attention of this man. So detectives now thought that James Baum may have become obsessed with Florence and upon hearing she was engaged to Claire, drove to Hamilton to kill her and accidentally killed her sister Ethel instead. But when investigators interviewed James Baum, they soon found out that Florence's story didn't check out completely. For one, James was under the impression that the two were engaged, as he was her boyfriend in Virginia. This was not Florence's only inconsistency, though. Her story changed numerous times. As an example, she began telling police she was in the bedroom when the shots were fired, when before, she claimed to be outside. Then, in other interviews, she stated she'd seen the man shoot Ethel. Even stranger was the autopsy, which, when completed, revealed that Ethel had been shot four times in the head, yet survived. And 15 minutes later, when she was still breathing, two more shots were unloaded into her heart. If that wasn't sketchy enough, a coachman was sitting outside a neighbor's home in his horse-drawn carriage waiting on a passenger around the time all this happened, and he would testify he saw no one entering or leaving the home other than Florence. Police, however, could never find the gun used in the murder, so they could not conclusively link it to Florence, although they did find out later on that when she lived in Virginia, she carried a revolver, but according to her, she sold it before returning to Canada. Now remember how I said the family may not have had this perfect little life that they showed to the outside world? That's where this comes into play, because Florence was in regular contact with James, and the family did not approve of this relationship. And in fact, one of the last letters sent from James was intercepted by Ethel and her mother Isabel. When James was asked about this, he would relay that Florence had told him she was actually a divorcee after being forced to marry a man that her family had chose. And... That was a complete lie. While all this was going on, she was also exchanging letters with a man named Harold she had met through a dating ad. I also have to note here, her family did not approve of her career choice, but the sources are kind of contradictory. Like, some say the family didn't even know she was an actress, and that she had told them she only performed in church services, because back then, churches often hired singers, and she did not want them knowing that she was an actress because they disapproved of the immoral lifestyle, especially her sister Ethel. So because of this, Florence took the stage name Mildred Dale. However, some sources state that they did know she was an actress and didn't approve, but they wanted to give her an opportunity to prove herself, but they did not know that she was a showgirl, so I'm not sure which one is accurate. But to make this a bit stranger, Florence also collected and compiled a scrapbook of fictitious newspaper clippings which described performances she never gave and documented awards she never received. There was also said to be tension between the two sisters because Florence was so pretty and got to go tour the states while Ethel remained at home and essentially became the in-home maid. It was also rumored that Florence was the favorite of her parents while Ethel was basically ignored. So investigators were now confident. Florence murdered her sister at an opportune time when everyone was gone and the family had just had an attempted break-in. It was the perfect time. But the family stood behind Florence and protested her innocence. In fact, the family lawyer pointed out everything the investigators brought up, like all the boyfriends, 
the lies about her acting, the collecting of fictional accounts of her career didn't mean anything when it came to the murder, and it was all just character assassination. Not to mention, the attorney had gotten a new lead altogether, and it goes back to James, her boyfriend in Virginia. He would tell a coroner's jury that an unknown man had been stalking Florence when she lived in Virginia. At one point, she even showed James a threatening letter that she had received from this man. She had even received gifted chocolates from an anonymous fan, thought to be the same person that was stalking her. Florence would throw away the chocolates for fear of them being poisoned. Of course, Florence had already been caught in a bunch of lies, and maybe this was one too, but with this lead out here now, police had to at least consider the fact that she did have an obsessed fan that stalked her back to Hamilton and then accidentally killed her sister, which makes a little bit more sense because presumably a fan would have never seen Florence up close and would have instead seen her from the audience, meaning a mix-up could have been possible. Regardless, the coroner's inquest was underway and Florence was grilled about her private life and at times would burst into fits of hysteria, one time collapsing and had to be carried out of the courtroom crying, I see that man, he will shoot me, he will shoot me. People are divided on if this was just Florence acting like she was having a breakdown or if she really had one. At the end of the inquest, the jury ruled that Ethel met her demise by persons unknown to them because the Crown had not provided good enough evidence to take it forward. But they offered a disclaimer. The Crown should continue on with its investigation. However, that was it. The Crown conceded defeat and dropped the investigation altogether. Florence went on to marry Claire, who died in 1918 of pneumonia, leaving Florence a widow. She would return to acting and died in LA in 1977. After having a pretty decent career in Hollywood, Thomas and the rest of the family end up moving after the media circus and lived out their life in Calgary. To this day, an official suspect has never been named, but the majority of the armchair sleuths believe that Florence murdered her sister Ethel over family tensions and then was somehow able to quickly get rid of the gun before police made it to the scene. Then her family defended her to keep from losing two daughters. Others think, however, she hired a hitman, possibly one of the vagrants near the home, to do the deed and flee, which would explain how the gun vanished so quickly. Others think that Florence indeed did have a stalker from Virginia that followed her back to Hamilton and then accidentally killed Ethel thinking he had found Florence and once realizing his mistake, fled the scene. While a few do genuinely believe that one of the vagrants broke in and killed Ethel and in a panic, Florence made some bad decisions which made her look guilty. Today, the case is known as the Canadian version of the Lizzie Borden murders. May 10th, 1973, Kenora, Ontario. A tense situation would unfold around 2.30 p.m. when a heavily armed man would enter a branch of the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce. The would-be robber was wearing a mask and carrying a rifle and had a pistol holstered. And while that may sound scary, that is not that abnormal. But there was one odd thing that set this robbery out as different than most. As the man was carrying a homemade bomb which had been built using six sticks of dynamite that he then stuffed into a shoulder bag. Most frighteningly, it contained a dead man switch that was clasped in the man's teeth. He also brought along three duffel bags which he told the teller to stuff them full of cash. He then told them to notify the police to supply him with a pickup truck to make his escape. As you might imagine, this woke up the sleepy little town of Kenora and police responded quickly, but they had a plan, which they came up with on the spot. They would take the pickup truck to the bank as the man had requested, but instead of leaving it sitting outside waiting on him, an undercover officer posed as the random truck driver and when he got to the bank, he walked in and handed the keys off to the robber, and the man fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. He told the truck driver slash undercover officer he was going to use him as a hostage, which is what the police wanted all along. So he told him to grab one of the duffel bags of money and carry it out for him, walking in front of the suspect. And now the brave officer, a Don Millard, did as told. 
and they slowly walked out of the bank in front of the robber just as they had drawn it up. The plan was going perfect so far because they wanted this man to take up as much time as possible going to the truck so they could fire off a shot and they didn't want to risk having a bank teller as a hostage. Although I do have to wonder, did they not believe the man really had a bomb? Because Officer Millard was sure taking a huge risk. By this point, the news had spread all over town and the wider area, and the press was actually already on the site to film the robber's exit. Along with hundreds of curious onlookers, this was now a very dangerous situation, but the police felt they had no choice but to make a move on it, and a marksman sitting in a cruiser across the street would pull the trigger and the bullet struck the robber, killing him, and the man fell to the pavement and the bomb detonated, obliterating the man. Crazily enough, the undercover officer who was in front of the suspect carrying the duffel bag was actually mostly shielded by the money he had been carrying, suffering only mild hearing loss. The police were initially raked over the coals for endangering the public, but after a review of the events, it was determined that they probably saved many lives by killing the man before he could get close enough to the crowd to possibly detonate. There's even some speculation that the man was going to trigger the bomb regardless and at one point, he stopped and seemed like he was about to confront the police and the onlookers. Some even think he could have had a grudge against the bank, or maybe the town of Kenora. I mean, surely there were bigger towns with more money, but maybe this one was easier to escape. There was even the thought that it was politically motivated. However, others contend the bomb was indeed a deterrent that he never intended to use, and the man was just desperate due to financial reasons. But now, the gruesome task of identifying the man and notifying the next of kin began, and that's where the real mystery starts. For one, there wasn't much left of this guy. One of the witnesses would even state he had been blown to smithereens, and since he wore a mask, really just a balaclava, the entire time of the robbery, no one outside or inside the bank ever seen his face. Detectives did find a wallet that contained $176, handcuff keys, and a receipt from a nearby hotel. This gave them their first real lead and they went to the location to learn the man had checked in on April 23rd, some 17 days prior under the name Paul Higgins. They soon found his luggage, a yellow trunk that also had the name Paul Higgins on it. This too looked like it was brand new, so case closed, right? Well, no, because that was a fake name, just like the address the man had given was also fake. But it was here at this hotel that he checked in on the 23rd, stayed two days, and boarded a bus for Winnipeg. In the meantime, he left the trunk in the hotel storage. He would return on May 5th, five days before the attempted robbery would take place. Where he was in those five days and what he was doing is still unknown to this day, although police speculate he went to Winnipeg to either return to a job or visit family or possibly round up supplies to build the bomb. In either case, they believed he had been scoping out this bank for a while, but detectives did not give up on identifying him. They soon began trying to find this yellow trunk, which definitely stood out, and they soon learned that it was sold only at a Canadian department store chain called Eaton's, but that's as far as they got. They could never definitively say which one of the stores it was purchased at, and they were at a dead end again until several witnesses came forward and claimed they had seen the man around town just days before the robbery, and they would describe him as being white with reddish brown hair and a beard, and in his 40s, he was about 5 foot 6 to 5 foot 8 and weighed about 170 pounds. This would lead to her only description and sketch of the man, as you can see here. The guns, meanwhile, were never linked to any other crimes, nor were they ever able to be traced to the owner. The dynamite as well could not be traced to any known purchase of explosives at the time. And since that stuff is tracked extremely close, detectives felt that the man had stolen the dynamite, possibly when he took the trip to Winnipeg. His accent did not stand out either, and his nationality, if he wasn't Canadian, could not be discerned either. Although Canadian investigators looked into missing persons reports as far away as Ireland and Scotland because of his red hair. And that's pretty much it. To this day, nobody knows who this guy was. At one time, police believed they identified him, squarely based on the fact that some man in Winnipeg had abandoned his truck there right before this happened, but this man was eventually tracked down and was living in France. 
The main theory now seems to be that whoever it was flew into Winnipeg for the weekend and didn't tell anyone. He then drove to Kenora to attempt to pull this off. Meanwhile, his family and friends, conceivably over a thousand miles away, had no idea what had happened and reported him missing. But they didn't have that crucial detail that he left town to go to Winnipeg. And since the man used a fake name, which was much easier to do flying in the 70s, there's no record of this individual getting onto a flight. So basically, the missing persons report just hasn't been connected yet. There's also the question if someone had been helping him out, or even forcing him to do it. However, if that's the case, this person has never been located either. July 5th, 1976, Cape Sable Island off the coast of Nova Scotia. Angler, Eisner Penny, was out on the water like most early mornings. This one, however, would end up being a little different. As he looked off into the sea, something would catch his eye. He seen some kind of creature slowly rising and then diving back down into the water. And while that's not unusual, this thing was massive. Eisner stared at it and eventually came to the conclusion that he was watching a whale, something not uncommon. But it began to approach the boat, and as it got closer, Eisner began to doubt that this thing was a whale. As it got near the boat, it was now poking out of the water a good 15 feet, and it just kept getting closer and was approaching the stern. That's when Eisner quickly opened the engine up and got out of there before the animal could crash into the boat. Now Eisner had three decades of experience out on the ocean as a fisherman, and in all that time, he had seen a lot of whales, and it's because of this, his account should have carried some weight, but he did not at first, because as he got back to the shore, he immediately told a few of his friends who were also fishermen, and they didn't believe him. In fact, they started making fun of him and cracked many jokes at his expense, but he would be a few days later when these two friends, Keith Ross and 24-year-old son, Rodney, were anchored out in the foggy waters when the younger Ross would see a creature moving about in the water. He called for Keith to come down, who looked and identified it as a sunfish. But as they got closer, both Keith and Rodney knew that assessment was wrong because now they realized this was something they had never seen before. The creature was about 50 foot in length and started coming out of the depths and headed straight towards the boat. Luckily, it missed and went on by. But it was here that Keith noted the thing had big eyes, as round as saucers and bright red looking, like they were bloodshot. They also popped out of the side of its head and were not in sockets. Its mouth was wide open and there were two tusk-like things hanging down from its upper jaw. The scales were grayish and looked something like snake skin, full of lumps and barnacles. It did have a fish tail that went up and down, not like a whale. Rodney noted that to him, the body looked like a huge seahorse. The two swung their boat around and quickly headed back to the dock to tell others what they had seen. And upon their trip back, they would run into none other than Eisner. And they slowed down to tell him what they had seen. Eisner refused to go back out after this and decided to wait a few days before fishing again. Now, if it was just these two reports, it could easily be written off as Keith and Rodney just continuing to give Eisner a hard time. But just a few nights later, another fisherman Edgar Nickerson, and his 15-year-old son, Robert, whom, from what I could find, did not know Eisner, Keith, or Rodney. And as they were out, they heard a splash out in the deep, and in the fog, they couldn't see anything. But a few minutes later, when they were pulling their gear out of the water, they heard a splash right by the boat. Edgar thought it was a whale, so he turned the sounder on, knowing that it usually scares whales away. But whatever was splashing around by the boat was not a whale. Unfortunately, that's all there was from this account. These were the three original reports of the creature that would become known as the Cape Sable Serpent. He wasn't spotted again until May 4th, 1997, when two fishermen, Charles Bungie and C. Clark, were off the coast of Fortune Bay on the southern coast of Newfoundland and found what they thought was a bunch of floating garbage bags. In trying to be environmentally conscious, they made their way to the bags to try and haul them out of the water but when they got within 50 feet of what they thought was trash, a creature with a six foot long neck and a head that looked like a horse whipped around to see them and then slid under the water and disappeared. This was the last official sighting 
of the Cape Sable Serpent. British Columbia, on the west coast near the border with the U.S. and Washington State, is home to our next mystery. Now, like the U.S., Canada, too, would have its own gold discoveries that led to periods of what we now know as gold rushes. And just as in the U.S., it led to the formation of a lot of towns that still stand to this day, and some that are now ghost towns. And that's exactly what Camp McKinney is, discovered and claimed by a man named Al McKinney, along with Fred Rice in 1888, this gold deposit was known as Caribou Mine, and after the migration of many people to the area, a town formed 12 years later called Camp McKinney, which sat on the slopes of Mount Baldy. The population at its height got up to around 250, and hosted a few hotels and a number of saloons, and in 1901, around 9,500 ounces of gold bullion was taken out of the mines, and within two more years, the gold was practically gone and everyone left, and soon it became a ghost town. But its legacy lives on in this next mystery. See, every few months during the mine's operation, the gold would be melted down to bars, which were then made easier to handle and transport by rail, where it was then taken to the company headquarters in Spokane, Washington. And since this was still in an era where the lands were untamed, this vast region was covered by only two police constables. So actually, Watching over the gold was left up to a group of trusted miners who would escort the gold to a train depot in Midway, about a 25 mile ride. The actual time the carriage would leave was always kept secret since the area was still a little wild and would be a great temptation to many robbers. Occasionally, a company official would take the gold himself. Of course, he went with this group of armed miners who could be sworn in at the last minute. And so we come to August 18th, 1896, when one of these officials, a A.D. Keene, the mine superintendent, would volunteer to take the gold. Usually, he was the general manager, James Monahan, but Keene actually had some business to attend to in Midway anyways, so he offered to take care of it. They would give him the typical instructions that one does on this journey, along with the precautions he needed to take to avoid being held up, and he left alone, carrying three gold bars in the buggy in a canvas bag, one large bar and two small ones, weighing around 656 ounces and valued at over $1 million today. But he didn't make it very far at all. In fact, he had only gotten about two miles away when he came around a sharp curve and ran into a masked man with a rifle who was waiting on him. The man motioned for him to throw down the saddlebags and he had little choice because he had left without an escort. Keen was armed himself but the guy had the drop on him. The bandit would tell Keen to turn around and drive back, and again, he had no choice and headed back to camp, where he immediately went and told James Monahan, the manager, who proceeded to check every one of the mining personnel, and he found nothing. He then sent someone to get the provincial police stationed at Midway, and he began organizing a posse and headed back to the scene of the robbery. It was here they would look over the area and did not find anything out of the ordinary, so they gave up and returned back to town. Later that day, the police constable showed up and asked routine questions and even went to the scene of the robbery. It's there that one of these officers, a Isaac Dinsmore, found an empty saddlebag that had been missed earlier. He also found some biscuits, apples, fresh eggs, part of a whiskey bottle, and a half-filled water bottle. This went to show that the man had been waiting for the go to come through for quite some time, but other than this one discovery, there were no other clues or leads. Law enforcement did believe he had not left the area, because Camp McKinney was very isolated and could only be accessed by two roads. It seemed impossible he was able to flee and not be seen, but modern takes on this case now dismiss that, and it's more than likely the man somehow got away. The mining company did post two separate rewards, $2,000 for the arrest and conviction of the guilty party, and $1,500 for the recovery of the gold. So, $3,500 in total, or in today's money, about $130,000, which is pretty crazy. And unsurprisingly, it generated a lot of interest. The first big tip came in in the form of a letter addressed to James Monahan, which was later published in a local paper. 
and it basically went on to say that he had met a man named Matthew Roderick at a bar in Oroville, California about three months before the robbery, and the two had started drinking, and Roderick had told him he was from Spokane, Washington, down on his luck, and planning on trying to rob a bullion shipment from Camp McKinney, saying it was an easy job. He carried a Winchester and told this man he liked how he handled his liquor and thought he would be cool enough under pressure, so he asked him to join, but he declined. And after declining, this Roderick said he would kill him if he told anyone about it. The two did end up going to Camp McKinney, where they worked for the mine for three months up until August, where the anonymous man writing this letter would then leave. He stated that a few days later, he read about the robbery and figured that it had to be Matthew Roderick. Monahan took this information and started checking his logbooks and soon discovered there was a man named Roderick that had worked there at the time, and he was not a good employee. Each week after collecting his pay, he would go to play poker and would never leave until he was broke, often ignoring his work shift for days at a time. He owned a small cabin on the outskirts of town, and on the day of the robbery, as well as the days leading up to it, he stated he couldn't work because of back pain. And several days after the robbery, he notified the mine that he intended to head back home to Seattle to recuperate from his injury. Crazily enough, the miners felt sorry for him and passed the hat around collecting $84, or about $3,000 in today's money, which he could use to have safe passage back home. The mining company, along with law enforcement, went to inspect the cabin, and they found old whiskey bottles behind it that had the same label as the one left at the crime scene. Officials were now certain they found their man. Soon, the famous Pinkertons were hired to keep Roderick under surveillance, and they found him really quick, as he had listed himself in the Seattle directory. The Pinkertons even hired a lady operative to move in next door, and she began chatting up Roderick and his wife. He soon told her he had paid up some back taxes and took out a $3,000 life insurance policy, which was certainly sketchy. They now believe that Roderick was only able to get away with one of the smaller bars, around $60,000 worth in today's money. Then one day, Mrs. Roderick would speak to this operative and tell her that her husband was leaving on a business trip that would make them rich. Of course, this agent tipped off her colleagues, and the Pinkertons followed Roderick by train to Loomis, Washington, where he purchased a horse and rode towards British Columbia. They believed he was going back to retrieve the rest of the gold he had hidden. When he reached town, he couldn't believe what he had seen. The whole area was on edge. Armed men were everywhere, and the only two roads in and out of town were blocked by armed guards. But on October 26th, he was able to sneak by and stealthily went up a dusty mountain road where one of these guards would spot him and alerted everyone in town. Everyone armed up and set out after him. By 10 p.m., the posse would make their way through the dark to see an object in the road, but they couldn't tell what it was. They then heard horse hooves, and Keen, the man who had been robbed and started all this, called out, Is that you, Matt? He remained silent for half a minute. Then a gunshot rang out, and Roderick fell to the ground dead. Keen had shot first, followed by one of the constables. The rifle Roderick was carrying was later identified by Keen as being the one he seen at the holdup. They also noticed the rifle had a rag stuffed in the muzzle, and it and the pistol were covered with rust and dirt, meaning Roderick had buried them previously. They also discovered that Roderick was wearing a coat made with a special vest inside that contained two huge pockets, large enough for the gold. And speaking of, it was not on him, nor was it anywhere around. It seems like he was on his way to recover it, and was killed in the process. Keen was not charged with his murder, and has since been absolved of the fictitious story that he promptly took the gold without an escort. Apparently, the company had for months now quit taking an escort, and they even announced the times that the gold would be coming through. The papers covering the story remarked it was more of a mystery how it took this long for them to be robbed. But the real mystery in this is, there are two gold bars hidden in this area, one of them really big, and presumably is still there today. That's not a legend or a folk tale. It's there, but no one can find it, and it's led to theories over the years about where it could be. There have been some reports that Roderick's body was found with candles, matches, and goggles, which suggest 
He hid the gold in one of the numerous water filled shafts, but it's never been confirmed that he actually had these items on him. Secondly, he was very pressed for time, and it doesn't seem like he could take such a huge risk to try and lower them down into the shafts because quite simply, he had to hurry. Others point to the fact that he no doubt buried the rifle and pistol in the general area where he was spotted and then killed, which brings up the question, why bury your rifle and pistol there and then put the gold in a totally different place? Wouldn't it be more convenient to put them in the same spot? This has led some to argue that he did not know they were suspicious of him, and he may have planned to hang out in town for a day or two before retrieving the gold on his way back out, where he had conveniently placed them next to the guns. But the other argument is, he did place the gold somewhere else, most likely somewhere between the mines and town, and after fetching his guns, he was headed that way when he was shot. Regardless, if someone found the bars today, they would become rich, assuming they were allowed to keep any of it, that is. And that brings us to the conclusion of the first installment of the Canadian Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg Explained. I hope you all enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments section if you would like to see me continue this series. I'm also going to begin working on the UK series and New England series. But for now, I will say goodbye and good night.